comes empty-handed and always brings a different treat each time he arrives. Delegate Paul Espinosa. Uh, Paul, inside this box, I want to show it to our audience because the, these you've never brought before. And this is one of these is enough dessert for maybe three people. But these are, these are amazing. What are these called? Uh, those are oh, hold, oh, hold on. I should turn up your microphone. There you All go. Right. Those are chocolate wow. eclairs, courtesy of Royal Licious. I don't know if Royal Licious is one of your advertisers, but if they're not, they should be. But yeah. uh, uh, stop by this morning. Uh, hope to bring in a few cannolis for you, but unfortunately, yeah. they they were out of cannolis. But uh, those chocolate cigars uh, seem like they would fit the bill. Uh, actually, uh, you know, while I'm sorry to hear that John has lar laryngitis, I was I was actually a little nervous before I heard he wasn't going to be here, thinking that I might. Uh, send him into a sugar coma and, and <laughs> cause him to miss his deadline. And so, uh, John, uh, sorry you're not here, but uh, it's probably for the best until you uh, finish up your book. Well, he could, he could have rode that sugar high. Maybe he got cranked out a few more pages. Well, there are a half a dozen there, so but that would be uh, bad for you guys probably. You know, the great thing about um, busting on a guy who's got laryngitis is he can't answer back. There you go. <laughs> so there's that. Well, I could, it's, uh, I, I could uh, uh, note the um, – some of the commercials that you've dubbed, uh, I can tell when it's been on, you know, uh, as you're coming out of some of yep. your laryngitis, you can definitely tell. Because some of those a last few years. Inflection on your, uh, oh, on yeah. your, your voice there. But. Uh, Paul, of course, is also the uh, Speaker Pro Tem in the uh, House of Delegates and is running for Senate now. That's State right. Senate, yeah. right? And uh, formerly the Education Chair, a couple of different stints doing that. Uh, too, Paul. So uh, no coincidence that uh, you're on following that segment we just had with James Paul and charter schools, which uh, a lot of folks were excited to see get up and running in West Virginia. Yes. Uh, I was not aware, however, that they would be effectively running a deficit spending the, the very first year, Paul. Well, that varies from school to school. I mean, there's typically our startup cost and uh, depending on the model that the uh, charter school, local charter school board employees, uh, you know, that can be uh, substantial. And as uh, James Paul, who uh, I think is doing an excellent job uh, as uh, executive director for the West Virginia uh, uh, Professional uh, School Board, uh, as he noted that, you know, we have as a legislature tried to go back in and tweak, continue to tweak the legislation to try to make it equitable, you know, help, help put our tradition or our, our uh, uh, public charter schools on an even uh, playing field with our traditional schools. And uh, so uh, some of it depends on the type of, of charter that you have. And the, the, our West Virginia Academy that's based up in Morgantown, very successful uh, charter school there who actually just uh, uh, was named a finalist for a national reward, uh, award. I'd be happy to talk a, a little bit more about that, share some of the details. Uh, they've chosen a model where they essentially are running the school themselves. You know, they, they've, you know, uh, believed that they had the wherewithal uh, to actually, you know, operate the school themselves. Whereas uh, the Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy in Jefferson County, they opted just as a number of uh, local uh, charter schools uh, boards around the country have opted to choose a third party in order to operate that. So I think there's. I think there's usually – it's not unusual to run a deficit in the early going. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Excel, who operates the Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy in Jefferson County, they actually acquired the property uh, on which they're located. You know, rather than engage in uh, continuing uh, lease payments for that facility, my general understanding is uh, – I believe, and uh, st uh, I stay in I'm happy to stay corrected, but I believe they actually purchased that property, which long-term will – you know, help their sustainability, but obviously that's a big uh, investment as well. So, is that considered part of their first year deficit? Of I'd imagine that? it's probably. A, I'd imagine it probably is part of it. There, um, I think. Um, I think the as James Paul noted, I think there's a number of factors that the local school board. Uh, and I'm talking about the school board associated with the Eastern Pan and the Preparatory Academy that they cited as leading to the deficit was. As James Paul, James Paul noted, they uh, seem to have a, a higher percentage of special needs children than anticipated, particularly some that who, who uh, apparently, you know, have significant needs that, uh, you know, just as they would be in a traditional public school, you know, do uh, incur or require uh, uh, considerable resources in order to provide the appropriate level of, of uh, support for those students. Um, many 
public charter school boards, uh, part of their role was also to engage in grant writing, try to uh, obtain grants to support the uh, program. And uh, my general understanding is that uh, some of those activities with the Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy uh, School Board haven't quite been where they would like it to be, at least at this uh, st- point in time. So I think there's a combination of factors. But one of the reasons why when we went back in and uh, tweaked the initial legislation uh, that we enacted back in 2019, I was actually the lead sponsor of the very first public charter school bill that uh, that authorized uh, charter schools for the first time. When we went back in in 2012, and expanded the number of uh, charter schools that could be authorized. One of the reasons that we included the creation of the West Virginia Professional School Board, this oversight body uh, of which uh, James Paul is the executive director, was to provide you know the necessary oversight and also the support uh, for our public charters to help them be successful. I know I was looking at uh, some of the comments on the um, Facebook feed this morning, and I see a few folks uh, lamenting the fact that, well, they don't seem to really have any rules. Well, uh, to be clear, our, our public charter schools are subject to rules, but uh, there absolutely is enhanced flexibility for our public charters. That's one of the you know, the uh, premises of establishing public charter schools is to provide them enhanced flexibility uh, so that they don't necessarily have the bureaucracy that I think sometimes uh, causes issues for our traditional public school systems. But just as importantly as the enhanced flexibility, I would say probably more so, is enhanced accountability. With a public charter school, uh, they have, uh, under under the legislation that we enacted, they have a charter with the authorizing organization in the case of uh, Eastern Penn and Preparatory Academy. I believe their charter is with the West Virginia Professional School Board. That charter could be no more than five years, and then it's up. It's subject to renewal or revocation, or you know, or non-renewal. So, uh, while I too am, am uh, optimistic, hopeful that uh, that that school will be ultimately will be successful. That's uh, the ultimate accountability. If you're not accomplishing what you indicate that you're going to, you say you're going to do when you uh, open this uh, charter school, the ultimate accountability is that that school can be either not renewed or if things uh, got to be too severe, uh, their charter could actually be revoked. So uh, there's the five-year review for accountability. Might that also work against a charter school trying to acquire its own property and building facility if after five years... They may be closed. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that is a consideration, and I think that probably speaks uh, to Excel's uh, commitment to the to the school. I think the fact that they actually went in and purchased that property. I mean, I think I think that confirms what I heard myself when I I actually uh, attended uh, the last meeting of the West Virginia Professional School Board, the Oversight Board, uh, and uh, an Excel representative was asked that great question as far as their their level of commitment in light of the uh, early deficits that they're incurring, and they indicated that they were absolutely committed uh, to the program. Now, that said, I, I don't think anyone could expect them to continue to incur year after year after year of deficits. Uh, but uh, they, I think that does signal that they are committed to the to the school. And um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing more from the local uh, Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy Board. I believe at the upcoming November meeting, I think it must be. Um, They'll, um, uh, the West Virginia Professional Charter School Board will hear a report from the uh, local board of the Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy to better understand you know, what their plans are going forward to help close that, that deficit. So uh, looking forward to hearing more about that. And again, I certainly stand ready to uh, you know, make, uh, uh, try to help make adjustments to the, to the legislation as we need to, but it can't just be about you know, throwing more money at the at the schools. I mean, we expect our, our charter schools, our public charter schools in particular, to operate efficiently. I think that's one of the premises of public charter schools is that typically they're able to operate more efficiently. And so um, we'll need to, uh, you know, better understand exactly what's contributing to this, how they're going to move forward, and then obviously look at ways that we can just make sure that uh, they're able to operate on an even playing field to our other public schools. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Delegate Espinosa. Thank Good you. Morning, for, I, I hope I find myself with one of those chocolate cigars 
They're pretty Actually. close. Uh, uh, Rob's keeping them pretty close. Over I know, there, so. I know. There's a half dozen there, and they're pretty think, big, so you'll get your share. Okay, good, good, good. Hey, so uh, you have interims coming up. That's right. Uh, when is that, and, and where is it? Is it going to be in Charleston, or is it on the road? These are in Charleston. Uh, we did uh, schedule two uh, off-site uh, charters, or charter, <laughs> Uh, interims. Uh, one was, uh, I guess, back in September, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that was over in Huntington. And then in November, we were we are scheduled to be in Wheeling, but the other interims this year are in Charleston. So those actually takes place this coming Sunday uh, through Tuesday and um, uh, will be a good opportunity to get some updates. Uh, I serve on the uh, House Finance Committee, so I know our Joint Finance Committee certainly will get an update as we typically do from uh, Revenue Secretary Dave Hardy and his staff as to where we are. Uh, I think by all indications that I know, uh, I think both uh, Delegate Householder as well as uh, uh, President Blair have reported that uh, we continue to be in really good shape despite the, despite the fact that we have enacted the largest personal income tax cut in state history, 21 and a quarter percent, which was, and some people that I talked to, uh, some constituents that I talked to, uh, aren't quite, uh, they, they seem surprised at the fact that that was retroactive to January 1st of this year. So, you know, they, they're already seeing or should be seeing the benefits of that. And despite the fact that we've reduced personal income tax by 21 and a quarter percent retroactive to January 1st, we're still running about a $200 million surplus. You know, for 224, the year. I think, is yeah, what Craig yeah. said. So all that's good news. And so we hear that. There's another item on our agenda, which I am particularly excited to to uh, to. Uh, talk about here about a little bit more it's legislation that i've uh, uh, sponsored in the past and certainly will do my best to try to get it across the finish line this session and that deals with our uh, unemployment insurance program in, in west virginia uh, one of the things we've tried to do um, you know through various pieces of legislation is to try to reduce the barriers to entry for our workforce uh, those folks that want to work in west virginia we obviously don't want to make it harder for them to enter the workforce so i've uh, sponsored a lot of licensure reform for example but the other thing we wanted to do frankly is to remove those incentives that you know perhaps encourage individuals to not you know be gainfully employed and again we're talking about able-bodied individuals uh, between you know working ages that uh, you know by all by all uh, rights, should be you know out working and supporting themselves. Uh, with the last thing we want to do is to provide incentives for them not to work. And so, one of the pieces of legislation that I've introduced in the past and uh, have sponsored is legislation that would index the number of weeks that an individual would be eligible for uh, unemployment insurance based on the current uh, unemployment rate. You know, in in West Virginia. Uh, in those times when unemployment levels are high, when that rate's high, then naturally we should have more robust uh, uh, coverage for individuals, you know, to bridge them until they're able to regain employment. But times like now when uh, unemployment rates are at historic lows, we should index those number of weeks so that individuals do have some incentive to return to the workforce. One of the other aspects of that legislation that I think is also, uh, I think, a very important uh, aspect of that proposal is that it would incent individuals who perhaps are, are, you know, have lost employment, are looking for employment, but perhaps aren't able to find the forever job that they're looking for, but perhaps do are able to find something that could be a at least a temporary step in, in gaining employment. Right now, there is a, uh, a big disincentive for individuals to do that because if they take a job that is paid at a lower rate than what their uh, unemployment benefits are providing, they essentially lose their unemployment benefits you know, in it while, seek, while accepting a lower paid job. The uh, premise of this legislation, because of the savings uh, that we'll, we'll be able to um, achieve through, again, just managing the number of weeks that individuals have uh, to a reasonable level, we can actually allow individuals who do accept some interim employment to continue to receive their unemployment benefits uh, while they're, you know, uh, work, working, uh, you know, at a uh, perhaps a slightly uh, lower paid job. One of the big metrics that I think the, un the unemployment uh, folks will tell you here in West Virginia is that the longer an individual is unemployed, when they lose employment, the longer they're on the sidelines, 
the less likely they are to return to the workforce. So one of the goals of that legislation would again be to remove that incentive, uh, per, you know, possible incentive not to accept a, a um, you know, a, a temporary type role, uh, remove that so that uh, individuals can remain engaged in the workforce, keep their work skills up to date while they're continuing to look for, you know, a, a job that is, is more in line with their long-term goals. And we're going to hear an update, so I should have said, we're going to hear an update at, uh, during House Finance or Joint Finance from Scott Atkins uh, with uh, uh, Workforce West Virginia uh, to uh, about that legislation and why he feels it's so important, how it's worked in other states so that our legislators can uh, better understand it and, and uh, you know address any questions that they might have. Well, the correction officer... Um, issue, which is the lack of in the state and the pay and the benefits and the structure. Um, I know that was addressed previously in an interim. Do you, is there any more work left to be done on that, or is it kind of a wait and see how these recent legislation is going to help or hurt? Well, I think it's going to be an ongoing uh, uh, effort, and I certainly commend uh, uh, Delegate Barrett, who I believe chairs that. Uh, He's a uh, senator now. A uh, senator, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I once knew him as a delegate, and uh, I aspire to uh, join him in the Senate. Hey, I, 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 had, I had to jump in there and defend him because <laughs> I, want, I, I want a free biscuit. That's my yeah. angle. November. Just wait till November. I can't wait. Um, he and uh, uh, Delegate Kelly, I do know that he's a delegate. <laughs> yes, uh, he is. Uh, they co-chair, uh, I believe, the jails uh, or corrections uh, uh, subcommittee uh, or committee, rather. And I think it's an ongoing issue. Like so many things in West Virginia, I mean, it's just you can't just, you know, pass one bill and say, oh, we've done that. I mean, look at uh, public charter schools, for example. I mean, that's we passed an initial bill, then we passed another bill to basically, you know, make it so that, it, it was really more feasible for uh, some of these charters that uh, that are now forming to be established and to keep them accountable. Same thing with our jails and, and, and um, our corrections employees. We need to continue to work on that and see how see what see if what we've enacted whether it's actually having an impact. And if it doesn't, then we need to do something different or do something more. Our guest is Delegate Paul Espinosa, and uh, we've been talking about charter schools in this uh, half-hour segment here and uh, uh, a few other things as well, including the upcoming interim sessions. Uh, Paul, is there anything that you want to make sure you addressed before we ran out of time this morning? Well, I guess we are right up against the time. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd like to address this whole debacle that we're experiencing down in Jefferson County. I mean, frankly, you know, it's a bit embarrassing for me, uh, and I'm sure You're both— You're talking about the Jefferson County Commission, just that's right. for those who maybe you. aren't reading your shorthand. <laughs> which which debacle? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <So. laughs> I wasn't going to say. Yeah. Um, no, it's uh, it's it's certainly uh, frustrating for me. I mean, you, I know both of you will recall that back when I was first elected in 2012, I was the first Republican uh, delegate whose district was wholly within Jefferson County. Uh, both Delegate Overton and uh, Delegate uh, Householder represented portions of, of uh, Jefferson County for, mm -hmm. for periods of time. But, uh, you know, that's kind of where it started, you know, with uh, two uh, uh, Democrat uh, colleagues in the House and, and two Democrat senators. I was kind of the lone Republican there. And, you know, uh, through, through my help and uh, a lot of uh, volunteers uh, out there waving signs, just doing all kinds of work, uh, you know, we, we – uh, and last year, we were able to sweep every legislative uh, seat there, and also, and and to build upon that, uh, we uh, you know picked up uh, the majority. Uh, actually, all at one point, all of the republic, all of the commission seats were Republican, and I don't know. I just uh, I just find it just uh, incomprehensible why you know some of my colleagues, uh, some of my friends who I, I actually helped uh, you know helped with their campaigns. You know why they uh, you know aren't willing to get in there and, and fulfill their responsibility. And as uh, Dee Kersey I think pointed out very eloquently yesterday, it's not an option to say, well, we're just going to wait until the next election because you know we don't perhaps like the the nominees that the uh, Republican Executive Committee provided. To be clear, I don't have a preference as to who's appointed, but I do have a desire to see that state code is followed and that the commission perform their responsibility and uh, get the commission back to full strength so that we don't have what's taking place today. There's a meeting coming up here, I think, in about five minutes or a couple minutes. I'm hoping they'll have a quorum today, but uh, it, uh, I'm not optimistic. You know, we just, I, I just would, would hope that they will you know, get back to work. Um, I'd also like to say, if I, if I have a minute, sure. is just to, um, 
you know, I think of the of the volunteers like the Republican Executive Committee. I mean, they don't get paid anything. Uh, they're again out there waving signs, working for candidates. They'd help. They've helped our party get where they are today, and their thanks for performing their duty uh, seems to be to be criticized by people that arguably are not doing their duty. So again, I just think we need to move forward. And uh, I can believe me, being in the minority during my first term, I understand what it's like when you don't have the votes to do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. But you know, not doing your your elected responsibility, I don't think is an option. And uh, for those of you who listen to the program, you know that I have invited Commissioners Jackson and Kraus onto the program since this began. Both have declined. I've followed up with uh, another opportunity that went unresponded to. So we've made an effort to get their side of the story on the show here. I don't want anyone to think we're providing providing, uh, one-sided information on this uh, on purpose. It's uh, by default, effectively, is, is how it works out. I thought D. Kersey yesterday uh, made it perfectly clear the legal obligation is to attend the meeting. The objection to the reason why they're not attending is not sound, according to Deke, and therefore shall, should be the operative word, shall appoint, uh, needs to be followed here. Now, it, it opens up the possibilities, if you want to look down the line as to cause and effect, Uh, that if you are, for instance, somebody in Jefferson County who is relying on these county commission meetings to go forward for whatever reason, and you are harmed by these meetings not going forward, it opens up the thought of possibility of legal action against the commission now because you could be harmed by their inaction. And so there could be liability. And I I know Matt Harvey can't talk about this because he's... He might be right in the middle of it. Legal counsel, <laughs> yep. so he's got to stay out of this. But Deke did bring this up to me, that it is possible that the commission could be exposing themselves to a legal situation here of liability. Well, and Commissioner Kraus, who, again, I consider a friend. Uh, I, I, I worked with her uh, to uh, to get elected. I certainly supported her campaign. But uh, when she initially raised the question of whether one of the three nominees uh, by the Republican Executive Committee were, uh, were, was a legal you know, was was eligible for the role. Um, you know, I kind of question that. I mean, uh, there are rules to handle conflicts of interest. You know, if you if you do have conflict of interest, obviously you abstain from discussion on that particular issue and you don't vote on that. That doesn't make you ineligible for the role. And so I thought that was kind of specious, uh, you know, argument to suggest that that individual was not eligible. And then when the Ethics Commission came back and said pretty clearly that uh, – they are not ineligible. They would simply have to follow, you know, the the normal recusal type of a process, and 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 so I think that kind of confirmed that uh, that that wasn't the case. And then uh, when when Commissioner Kraus uh, then stated that her goal was basically to delay the appointment of this individual until the next election, then I think that kind of confirmed what I think a lot of folks suspected is that this really wasn't about whether that any of the, any individual wasn't eligible. It was more about uh, delaying uh, the appointment of this, of this person. And again, I just, I can appreciate being in a position where maybe you don't think you have the votes to achieve what you're looking for, but uh, I just don't think that is uh, a basis on which to not perform your your responsibility that uh, the voters elected you to. So just want to encourage folks to move forward and get this behind us. Some of the trepidation in appointing this person, Paul, stems over the solar farms in Jefferson County. Yeah. And uh, the thought being that these are bigger and more invasive and pervasive than they were sold as being. It's changing the face of Jefferson County from what was a beautiful bucolic county to ugly solar farms for a a lack of a better way of putting it and the the rest of the complaints on the solar farms are all we're doing is powering Loudoun County with these I don't know if there's any validity to that or not but uh, from your perspective what you see in Jefferson County are the solar farms and eyesore yeah well I have mixed feelings I mean I'm uh, I'm very much a property rights person I think as long as someone is abiding by by applicable laws uh, whatever the whatever the laws are that have been put in place uh, um you know, I think folks should be entitled to do with their property as they wish, but uh, certainly uh, miss uh, 
you know, seeing, uh, you know, kind of the undisturbed uh, landscape as well. Um, uh, actually, uh, attend a, a church uh, right next to one of the solar farms there. And uh, I believe at some point after all the construction's uh, complete, there'll be uh, screening that I think is required by Jefferson County um, uh, ordinance uh, or regulation. Uh, you know, there'll be screening and so forth. But it's a, it's a, I think there's arguments on both sides of that. But I mean, that's why we have a county commission to represent the county to try to work those uh, work through those type of issues. Oh, you so, thought you did. Well, well that's I, I would hope that, they, that we can get back to that case. And again, um, I, I, you talk about liability. Uh, certainly, there were some questions regarding what occurred when uh, a vote was taken on that issue uh, when um, the issue wasn't clearly on the agenda. Um, I I. And uh, as I understand it, I think uh, the uh, county attorney that was that was present at the meeting tried to offer advice and tried to caution against taking action that wasn't specifically on the agenda and was, I think, as I understand it, told, well, I didn't ask for your opinion. I could only imagine a plaintiff, uh, namely a solar uh, organization that is harmed by this type of leg- uh, this uh, this uh, vote. I can only imagine the potential liability to the county for that. But uh, anyway, well, hopefully I, we can get beyond that. I can <clears throat> tell you that I, I, I was just informed that there was they did not show again for the meeting set for today. And so the, the meeting once was, again, it once again adjourned with no quorum. When does the uh, have this has the 15 days expired already, Matt? Are they into the, the next phase of that in terms of the shall appoint the fifth? The 15 day. From receipt uh, from the executive committee, yeah, yes. And what's the next deadline clock here? Is there one, or are we just waiting now for someone? We're to... we're, hey, we're we're past the uh, clock. Deke Kersey yesterday said that he had heard that there was legal action filed yesterday in a court. Are you aware of that? Are you able to comment if there has been? Yes, there was a legal action filed by a pro se litigant against. And put put that in terms that I would, who didn't go to law school to understand somebody without an attorney filed a a lawsuit uh, against the JREC and Steve Roberts as the president of the Jefferson County Republican Executive Committee. Uh, any idea what side of the aisle they are in regards to filing this? Oh yeah, yes, yes. It's 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 um, are they are they people who are in support of Commissioner Stolifer or Commissioners Jackson and Kraus? Jackson and Kraus. And and they're alleging that the bio, that the J R the J C R E C did not follow their bylaws. That's, Jefferson that's, County Republican Executive Committee. Yeah, that's the that's the, this is over the voice vote. Yes, that's the general allegation that I, that as I understand it, without and, reading it in detail. And yesterday, I specifically asked D. Kersey if that was a legitimate objection, and he unequivocally said no. You can't comment at this I'm point not because now comment. you're in touch. Which is fine. Just, I'm not trying to beat right, you into right, it. I'm, right. I'm, I'm yes, me. he did say that on on. I can. <laughs> I mean, I I was listening. So yes, that's if that's if you're saying this. Yes, that's what he said. So the next thing is this would then go to a circuit judge to rule. I don't know what the next process procedure is on that lawsuit. I I didn't really review it. I just okay. know because it doesn't involve the county commission. So it involves the JCREC. Right. Right. What I kind of gathered from Deke's uh, statement yesterday, and, and I think you're you're correct in, in what you heard. I heard the same thing. Um, barring, a, and again, I'm not an attorney, and I don't, I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn last night either. But uh, but you did bring donuts. Uh, I did bring I did bring uh, chocolate cigars. But uh, you know, barring a, a stay by the issue by a judge, I mean, again, I just don't think there's any basis not to act on a, you know, uh, the nominations and. Again, if the if uh, the court uh, determines that it was there was something improper or that it or that action should be delayed, uh, certainly there is an opportunity for the judge to uh, to make that known. Paul, thanks so much for your appearance today. We appreciate your time. Always appreciate talking to you guys. Have a great day. And for the dessert, yes, thank you for that. Enjoy. <laughs>